can be really stressful when you have trouble finding something important. You're late to an appointment and can't find your keys. We all find ourselves in situations like these at one time or another. Believe it or not, organizations deal with the same kind of trouble. Take a few seconds to think of the number of important assets you have nearby. I'm thinking of my phone, wallet, and keys, for example. Next, imagine that you're just joined a security team for a small online retailer. The company has been growing over the past few years, adding more and more customers. As a result, they're expanding their security department to protect the increasing numbers of assets they have. Let's say each of you are responsible for 10 assets. That's a lot of assets. Even in this small business setting, that's an incredible amount of things that needs protecting. A fundamental truth of security is you can only protect the things you account for. Asset management is the process of tracking assets and the risk that affects them. All security plans revolve around asset management. Recall that assets include any item perceived as having value to an organization. Equipment, data, and intellectual property are just a few of the wide range of assets businesses want to protect. A critical part of every organization's security plan is keeping track of its assets. Asset management starts with having an asset inventory, a catalog of assets that need to be protected. This is an essential part of protecting organizational assets. Without this record, organizations run the risk of losing track of all that's important to them. A good way to think of asset inventories is as a shepherd protecting sheep. Having an accurate count of the number of sheep help in a lot of ways. For example, it would be easier to allocate resources like food to take care of them. Another benefit of asset inventory might be that you get an alert if one of them goes missing. Once more, think of the important assets you have nearby. Just like me, you're probably able to rate them according to the level of importance. I would rank my wallet ahead of my shoes, for example. In security, this practice is known as asset classification. In general, asset classification is the practice of labeling assets based on the sensitivity and importance to an organization. Organizations label assets differently. Many of them follow a basic classification scheme, public, internal only, confidential, and restricted. Public assets can be shared with anyone. Internal only can be shared with anyone in the organization, but should not be shared outside of it. And confidential assets should only be assessed by those working on a specific project. Assets classified as restricted are typically highly sensitive and must be protected. Assets with this label are considered need to know. Examples include intellectual property and health or payment information. For example, a growing online retailer might mark internal emails about a new product as confidential because those working on the new product should know about it. They might also label the doors at their offices with a restricted sign to keep everyone out who doesn't have a specific reason to be in there. These are just a couple of everyday examples that you may be familiar with from your prior experience. For the most part, classification determines whether an asset can be disclosed, altered, or destroyed. Asset management is a continuous process, one that helps uncover unexpected gaps in security for potential risks. Keeping track of all that's important to an organization is an essential part of security planning. Security teams classify assets based on value. Next, let's expand our security mindset and think about this question. What exactly is valuable about an asset? These days, the answer is often information. Most information is in a digital form, we call this data. Data is information that is translated, processed, or stored by a computer. We live in a connected world. Billions of devices around the world are linked to the internet and are exchanging data with each other all the time. In fact, millions of pieces of data are being passed to your device right now. When compared to physical assets, digital assets have additional challenges. What you will need to understand is that protecting data depends on where that data is and what it's doing. Security teams protect data in three different states, in use, in transit, and at rest. Let's investigate this idea in greater detail. Data in use is data being accessed by one or more users. Imagine being at a park with your laptop. It's a nice sunny day and you stop at a bench to check your email. This is an example of data in use. 
as soon as you log in, your inbox is considered to be in use. Next is data in transit. Data in transit is data traveling from one point to another. While you're signed into your account, a message from one of your friends appear. They sent you an interesting article about the growing security industry. You decide to reply, thanking them for sending this to you. When you click send, this is now an example of data in transit. Finally, there's data at rest. Data at rest is data not currently being accessed. In this state, data is typically stored on a physical device. An example of data at rest would be when you finish checking your email and close your laptop. You then decide to pack up and go to a nearby cafe for breakfast. As you make your way from the park towards the cafe, the data in your laptop is at rest. So now that we understand these states of data, let's connect this back to asset management. Earlier, I mentioned that information is one of the most valuable assets that companies can have. Information security, or InfoSec, is the practice of keeping data in all states away from unauthorized users. Weak information security is a serious problem. It can lead to things like identity theft, financial loss, and reputational damage. These events have potential to harm organizations, their partners, and their customers. And there's more to consider in your work as a security analyst. As our digital world continually changes, we are adapting our understanding of data at rest. Physical devices like our smartphones more commonly store data in the cloud, meaning that our information isn't necessarily at rest just because our phone is resting on a table. We should always be mindful of new vulnerabilities as our world becomes increasingly connected. Remember, protecting data depends on where the data is and what it's doing. Keeping track of information is part of the puzzle that companies solve when considering their security plan. Understanding the three states of data enables security teams to analyze risk and determine an asset management plan for different situations. Security is all about people, processes, and technology. It's a team effort, and I mean that literally. Protecting assets extends well beyond one person or a group of people in an IT department. The truth of the matter is that security is a culture. It's a shared set of values that spans all levels of an organization. These values touch everyone, from employees to vendors to customers. Protecting digital and physical assets requires everyone to participate, which can be a challenge. That's what security plans are for. Plans come in many shapes and sizes, but they all share a common goal, to be prepared for risks when they happen. Placing the focus on people is what leads to the most effective security plans. Considering the diverse backgrounds and perspectives of everyone involved, ensure that no one is left out when something goes wrong. We talked earlier about the risks as being anything that can impact the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of an asset. Most security plans address risks by breaking them down according to categories and factors. Some common risk categories might include the damage, disclosure, or loss of information. Any of these can be due to factors like the physical damage or malfunctions of a device. There are also factors like attacks and human error. For example, a new school teacher may be asked to sign a contract before their first day of class. The agreement may warn against some common risks associated with human error, like using a personal email to send sensitive information. A security plan may require that all new hires sign off on this agreement, effectively spreading the values that ensure everyone's in alignment. This is just one example of the types and causes of risks that a plan might address. These things vary widely depending on the company, but how these plans are communicated is similar across industries. Security plans consist of three basic elements policies, standards, and procedures. These three elements are how companies share their security plans. These words tend to be used interchangeably outside of security, but you'll soon discover that they each have a very specific meaning and function in this context. A policy in security is a set of rules that reduce risks and protects information. Policies are the foundation of every security plan. They give everyone in and out of an organization guidance by addressing questions like, what are we protecting and why? Policies focus on the strategic side of things by identifying the scope, objectives, and limitations of a security plan. For instance, newly hired employees at many companies are required to sign off on an acceptable use policy, or AUP. These provisions outline secure ways that an employee may access corporate systems. Standards are the next part. 
These have a tactical function as they concern how well we're protecting assets. In security, standards are references that inform how to set policies. A good way to think of standards is that they create a point of reference. For example, many companies use the password management standard identified in this special publication 800-63B to improve their security policies by specifying that employees' passwords must be at least eight characters long. The last part of a plan is its procedures. Procedures are step-by-step -step instructions to perform a specific security task. Organizations usually keep multiple procedure documents that are used throughout the company, like how employees can choose secure passwords or how they can securely reset a password if it's been locked. Sharing clear and actionable procedures with everyone creates accountability, consistency, and efficiency across an organization. Policies, standards, and procedures vary widely from one company to another because they are tailored to each organization's goals. Simply understanding the structure of security plans is a great start. For now, I hope you have a clearer picture of what policies, standards, and procedures are and how they are essential to making security a team effort. Having a plan is just one part of securing assets. Once the plan is in action, the other part is making sure everyone's following along. In security, we call this compliance. Compliance is the process of adhering to internal standards and external regulations. Small companies and large organizations around the world place security compliance at the top of their list of priorities. At a high level, maintaining trust, reputation, safety, and the integrity of your data are just a few reasons to be concerned about compliance. Fines, penalties, and lawsuits are other reasons. This is particularly true for companies in highly regulated industries like healthcare, energy, and finance. Being out of compliance with a regulation can cause long-lasting financial and reputational effects that can seriously impact a business. Regulations are rules set by a government or other authority to control the way something is done. Like policies, regulations exist to protect people and their information, but on a larger scale. Compliance can be a complex process because of the many regulations that exist all around the world. For our purpose, we're going to focus on a framework of security compliance, the US-based NIST Cybersecurity Framework. Early in the program, you learned the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. One of the primary roles of NIST is to openly provide companies with a set of frameworks and security standards that reflect key security-related regulations. The NIST Cybersecurity Framework is a voluntary framework that consists of standards, guidelines, and best practices to manage cybersecurity risks. Commonly known as the CSF, this framework was developed to help businesses secure one of their most important assets, information. The CSF consists of three main components, the core, its tiers, and its profiles. Let's explore each of these together to build a better understanding of how NIST CSF is used the core is basically a simplified version of the functions or duties of a security plan. The CSF core identifies five broad functions. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Think of these categories of the core as a security checklist. After the core, the next NIST component we'll discuss is its tiers. These provide security teams with a way to measure performance across each of the five functions of the core. Tiers range from level one to level four. Level one, or passive, indicates a function is reaching bare minimum standards. Level four, or adaptive, is an indication that a function is being performed at an exemplary standard. You may have noticed that CSF tiers aren't a yes or no proposition. Instead, there's a range of values. That's because tiers are designed as a way of showing organization what is and isn't working with their security plans. Lastly, profiles are the final component of CSF. These provide insight into the current state of a security plan. One way to think of profiles is like photos capturing a moment in time. Comparing photos of the same subject taken at different times can provide useful insights. For example, Without these photos, you might not notice how this tree has changed. It's the same with NIST profiles. Good security practice is about more than avoiding fines and attacks. It demonstrates that you care about people and their information.